Hello and welcome to episode 21 for March 2014. We're interrupting our plans for world domination for one hour and one hour only to bring you a light-hearted look at life, the universe and everything, but be under no doubt, once we're finished we're getting right back to our megalomaniacal ambitions, heat ray preparations, tripod construction and red wean cultivation, and there's only one thing you can do to cheer us up and maybe prevent our imminent attack. Stop sending all those paltry little rovers and orbiters with their ridiculous solar panels and their contaminated drills and in some cases their inability to even reach Mars. Yeah, we're looking at you, Russia. Will the UK please pick up that barbecue set you dumped on us a few years ago? But anyway, on with the show. I'm Ralph, your host for perhaps the last hour of humanity and joining me with his portable heat ray teleporter pipe and slide rule is the anachronistically fearsome Paul. Felicitations, good people of Soul 3. May the day find you trembling in fear and suitably cowed into submission to better aid the day we conquer your quaint little world. And this month's news includes a supernova in a nearby galaxy, Paul explains redshift in his five-minute concept, and we have listeners' questions about the sun and the destructive power of a supernova. And coming up in a moment is another astronomy field report. Following the popularity of Damien's adventures under the dark skies of rural Pakistan, we have an audio report of my Northern Lights hunting trip in Iceland. But before we get into that, you've been to Lake Okapi this month with the good people from the Herschel Museum and the Science and Technology Facilities Council. What was all that about? Yeah, well, the National Trust, which for those outside the UK is a heritage organisation, looks after some of the most important buildings and landscapes in the country. Mm. Well, at their Leacock Abbey site in Wiltshire, they put on a fantastic event called Dark Sky Discovery in partnership with the STFC, the Science Technology Facilities Council, the Herschel Museum in Bath, and the local astronomy group Wiltshire Astro. Um, It was a particularly stunning setting for it, Um, not only because the beautiful location, um, but the Fox Talbot Museum, which where most of the event was held, was actually the birthplace of photography. Um, Photography being the invention of William Fox Talbot, um, who was based there in the 19th century. Sounds like a lot of history there. What was on offer? Yeah, uh, well, we had workshops on optics, um, stellar spectra, meteorites, moon rocks and Mars rocks, which we all got to hold and examine. Oh, cool. Uh, Very cool. Um, The the, the iron meteorite was particularly interesting. Very heavy. Very Uh heavy. Um, There were some great activities about comets and galaxies for kids. Um, There was going to be some solar astronomy on offer, but the the weather, as it has been all month, didn't (laughs) play ball at all. But the two standout offerings were the infrared workshop provided by the STFC uh, with guys who were working on the James Webb Telescope Mm. and a fantastic display of some of the great astro-images of the last few years. Um, It's all all really brilliant event, really inspirational to see so many families and kids engaging with real scientists and Mm. astronomers. Uh, It was a big well done um, to the man from STFC's Star Lab as well who dealt with a question about aliens and abductions in a polite and beautifully scientific <laughs> answer. Uh, and it kept his cool very, very well. Um, so good job, National Trust, and all those involved. Oh, that sounds so cool. Well, on with the show, and um, we'll start with my Aurora Field Report from Iceland. Uh, but let's split it up. It is rather long. So right now I'm stood in the beautiful region of Thingvetler, about 50 miles outside of Reykjavik, and this is where the Mid-Atlantic Ridge lies. This ridge makes this whole area hugely volcanic. It has been ever since this island of Iceland was formed. But right now there's around about a thousand earthquakes that are only detectable with seismometers every single day, and it's inevitable that at any time there could be more earthquakes and even volcanoes erupting. You remember the uh, the one recently that that threw ash all over Europe and disrupted air traffic control. Well, this island is hugely volcanic, and it's that volcanic activity, this tectonic activity, that makes it so beautiful and so unique. And it really is absolutely beautiful. It's a beautiful sunny day, and I'm looking at the the way that a canyon's been carved out in between two sets of rocks that are rising up by the left and to the right of me. On the right, I can see over flatlands and fjords and beautiful lakes. The sun's glistening on them, and it's all flat land apart from the mountains in the distance. And I look over to my left, and I can see the the ridges of the American mountains. And what I'm looking at is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where two giant tectonic plates, the American and the Eurasian tectonic plates, are being moved apart by subduction. New seafloors being created where they move apart, and they move apart about an inch every year. So that's about a mile every 60,000 years, something like that. 
and this runs from north to south through the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. But here, where the crust was thin, lava rose up and created this beautiful island that's full of geysers and waterfalls and has these stunning aurora displays that I'm here for. And just to bring this back to astronomy for a moment, that inch every year is a little bit more than the Earth is moving away from the sun each year and a little bit less than the moon is moving away from the Earth each year. But here on this island, you can look straight ahead and see pretty much the European tectonic plate on the right, the American mountainous tectonic plate on the left. And it really is one of those unique places in the world that is just so stunning to look at. And later on with these wonderful clear skies, I'm hoping to get some auroras. So hopefully in a few hours, it'll be getting nice and dark again. And I'll be able to tell you all about that. Well, there wasn't much astronomy in that. Well, I got the recession of the moon and the earth in. Sure, then. I mean, come on. Mm. Uh, get on with the news. Well, in the news this month, there's really only one place to start, and that's with the supernova in the cigar galaxy M82. Yes, this was an event that we all got involved in um, with from our gardens and balconies. It's, it's a, got a nice story behind it too. Yeah, it has. It was uh, discovered by a piece of luck really because these days professional astronomers rarely spend nights gazing into the skies to look for new discoveries. That's largely left to automated survey telescopes now. But Dr Steve Fossey at University College London spotted this object as he was given a telescope workshop to some undergraduates and he'd actually only decided to use a camera because there was some cloud around that stopped him giving his planned practical astronomy class. So he stuck a CCD imager on a 14-inch scope and then asked his students to pick an object in Ursa Major purely because that was an area of sky that was still cloud-free and they chose MH2, the cigar galaxy. And I've imaged M82 lots of times myself, but if I saw a bright star there, I think I'd probably think it was a star from our galaxy between our solar system and the object galaxy, but Steve Fossey knew what MH2 looked like well enough to spot that there may have been a supernova there. And we love spotting new supernovae, especially when they're in a galaxy that's near enough for professional astronomers to gather quality data and then also be observable in amateur scopes so that you can see them for yourselves. And we all did, didn't we? We saw amateur images flooding our Twitter timeline that let us see the supernova reach its peak and then plateau in brightness. But for us, it became a battle against the weather. Mm. We were just waiting for that clear night. Um, I was waiting to go out and image it with my four and a half inch scope from the landing strip here at Cydonia Base, and you were wanting to scale the face of Mars for a visual observation. And I think you saw it visually before I got the chance to set up and take some images. But even in the 30 second test images that I took, it was clearly there. It was shining away, actually brighter than the galaxy itself. Yeah, I was actually running an astronomy event in a school on the first clear night after it was spotted and was desperate to get a scope on it. Unfortunately, Ursa Major was smack behind a street light and a Ooh. tree. So it was a race home after the event to get the scope set up and again and, and get eyeballs on it after spending the night looking at Jupiter with students and constantly looking over my shoulder with a certain amount of impatience. <laughs> um, really stunning moment. Uh, it, it's I've looked at MA2 many times over the years and the bright spot was really obvious. Yeah, and luckily our enslaved sound engineer, John's got a scope two inches larger than the one that actually first captured this supernova at UCL. So due to the laws of slave ownership here on Mars, I got to see the supernova with incredible clarity. And in a 16-inch scope from a dark sky, the view was just amazing. Mm. The galaxy was so clear at a 10mm eyepiece that you could see the dust lanes that run through the middle of MH2, and the supernova looked about magnitude 9 to me on the verge of binocular visible what magnitude were you put it at when you saw it? Well, when I saw it, I, w I would have said it was around 10, 11. Um, early predictions had it possibly achieving 8.5. And that's actually brighter than the accepted magnitudes that suggest that it rose from magnitude 11.5 at its discovery on the 21st of January to magnitude 10 at its peak on the 2nd of February, remembering that the magnitude scale runs backwards, so magnitude 10 is brighter than magnitude 11.5. And since then, it's been gradually fading away, but at around 12 million light years away, you really do get an idea of the energy that these mm. supernovae put out to be able to shine brighter than the rest of the entire galaxy. Uh, and it was a Type 1a supernova where a cooling ember of a dead star called a white dwarf pulls material from a companion star until it's accumulated enough mass to compress with enough force to blow the dead star apart. Um, it starts fusing again. Another theory suggests these supernovas also happen when two white dwarfs collide, which would be a very impressive event. Probably yeah. quite a rare event. <laughs> um, so we should learn more about these events from the observations uh, that have been made of this supernova.
Yes, because we don't observe many as nearby as this. On the rare occasions that they do go off in our galaxy, we get advance notice in the form of neutrinos that arrive a few hours before the light of the explosion. But the neutrinos from a supernova in other galaxies don't have the energy to make it all the way here, and we get no warning to observe them happen, therefore. So while we can guess at how long this supernova went unobserved from the models we have, we're still hoping for more amateur images of M82 in the few nights before the 21st of January, if they exist, to refine our models and hopefully pin down a definitive understanding of Type 1A supernovas. Yeah, and yet another way that amateur observations and images can help professional astronomy. Mm. Um, but we also got reports of other supernovas going off around that time too. Yeah, it got quite exciting. It was like a celestial mm. firework <laughs> show for a moment. We had Messier 99 in Coma Berenices that gave us a magnitude 14 Type 1C supernova. Um, this is different to the Type 1A we saw in M82. This is a core collapse supernova and we don't see the signatures of silicon and helium in the light they emit. And this was more than four times further away than M82, so it's not surprising that it didn't get as bright, but still visible in large telescopes, 12-inch scopes or larger should easily have picked it out for visual observers. And we also saw a Type 2 supernova a few days earlier in the galaxy NGC 3448 near the star Merak, also in Ursa Major. But at 68 million light years away, this one was much fainter. Yeah, but easily within reach of amateur astrophotography. Um, so what's next in the news? Well, you remember last month we had the news story about the Hubble Space Telescope spotting water plumes on Jupiter's moon Europa. Yes. Well, the Herschel Space Observatory has now got in on the act too. And this is from the data already collected and continuing to be analysed after Herschel ran out of liquid helium coolant and was retired. That's right, yeah. It stopped working last year, but the data that was gathered by the Far Infrared Hi-Fi instrument before Herschel was decommissioned observed water vapour on or around Ceres, the largest dwarf planet in the solar system. Cool. So Ceres sits in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and right about the distance from the Sun that comets start to warm up enough to start outgassing. But Ceres doesn't seem to be melting like a comet does. It appears to have two dark spots on its surface, and these absorb more energy than the Sun than their surroundings. And unsurprisingly, Herschel sees two vents on Ceres that correspond to these dark regions. They can actually estimate that they're venting around 6 kilograms of water per second, which is impressively precise, but the real benefit of this find is that it helps us learn about the evolution of the solar system, water concentrations in the asteroid belt, and possibly even the origins of water on Earth. But this is just a teaser, because next year we're going to learn a lot more about Ceres. Yeah, well, we hope so, because NASA's Dawn spacecraft left the asteroid Vesta in September mm -hmm. 2012, I think it was, yeah. for a rendezvous with Ceres this time next year. And it was known that Ceres is an icy asteroid, one that's large enough to get the dwarf planet designation. But this find shows us that there's likely to be more surprises when Dawn gets there, too. Yeah, so while we've been getting excited by a multitude of European space missions and ground-based discoveries, China's been getting in on the act, and they're not. And they might be again? Yeah. We, uh, we reported in the news over the last couple of months about the Chinese lunar lander and rover that comprises the Chang'e 3 mission. And it's been a series of ups and downs for the Chinese National Space Administration on this mission. Mostly ups, but we're in a limbo at the moment, because... Well, I think this is going to turn into a bit of a rant, but we all got excited when Chang'e 3 launched on the 1st of December last year with a flurry of press attention, and then during the descent of the lander and rover on the 14th of December, which, uncharacteristically for the Chinese, was covered by state media TV in real time, and in English for English-speaking viewers. And this got a lot of people, including me, thinking that perhaps the Chinese were going to be more open about their space activities and let the public enjoy the experience in the way that we share every moment of any... NASA and ESA space mission, but I guess our early optimism was misplaced because the National Space Administration reverted to type and shrouded almost everything in secrecy since it landed. Yeah. We've had the drip feeding of low resolution images from the Moon where the rover has been exploring the lunar regolith. That's the soil made up of fine dust from millions of meteor impacts, and it's been using its spectrometers to analyse the chemical composition of the soil and its ground penetrating radar to measure the depth and structure of the outer layers of the Moon. But none of the data is likely to be released, and very few videos or images have been made public. And if the Chinese National Space Administration wants to see how space exploration is done in the 21st century, they should go to JPL's Cassini website or ESA's Venus Express site, where there's a new data dump whenever there's any new images or data for the public to see. In the case of Cassini and the Mars Science Laboratory site, that's dozens of images each and every day. Okay, 
rant's over, it's out of my system, China, you do what you want. Yeah, I guess it's just not the governmental culture of China at the moment to be open about this. Um, despite people from another state having actually been there and put boots in the dust, the mm. moon is not exactly a state secret. I guess that means Awesome Strong is no longer available in China then. Hey, no. Um, <laughs> well, certainly not now, anyway. No. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the rover's solar powered, so it needs to return to the nuclear powered lander in order to keep warm and alive during the lunar nights, which last 14 Earth days which it successfully did for the first two lunar nights. But before the third one on the 25th of January, we heard via a Chinese media outlet that there was a mechanical control abnormality and chances of surviving the next 14 days of lunar darkness were unlikely. The next lunar dawn was the 12th of February and as expected, no signal was heard from the rover. But a day later, we heard that while the abnormality wasn't resolved, the rover was able to receive and send commands. But since the 13th of February, we've had one image released without explanation of the lander taken by the rover suggesting the rover's roving again. A tweet from the state media saying it went into sleep mode again on the 22nd of February, a week before the lunar night came, and it's all got rather cryptic and hard to decipher, except for the information that the British amateur radio enthusiasts put out via their website and Twitter. That's at UHF underscore SATCOM if you want to take a look. And they're monitoring the rover's 8,462 MHz X-band radio signal. And if you want to examine the region that the rover sits in, it's in the Mary Imbrium, halfway between the Recti Montes range and the prominent Leverrier crater. Again, you won't see the rover or lander, but the cracks, craters and scarps in the Mary Imbrium are well worth exploring on any available night. So, what's next? Well, the European Space Agency has chosen its next medium-class science mission, and you'll remember that we told you last month about the candidates hoping to be selected. Yes, there was an asteroid mission, um, an exoplanet hunting mission, and a couple of physics experiments. Yeah, they're the ones, and I think you said you'd like to see the asteroid mission get selected, and I opted for the fundamental physics mission. And, well, neither has got our first choice, because it seems that exoplanets are still the coolest gig in town. So the mission that got overlooked last year and went back to this year's panel at ESA, the PLATO mission, was finally given the green light on the 19th of February this year. PLATO being a tenuous acronym for planetary transits and oscillation of stars. <laughs> uh, and this looks for planets around nearby stars a bit like NASA's TESS mission will do in the same year, 2017. Yeah, TESS will survey the whole sky for nearby exoplanets for the James Webb Space Telescope to do follow-up studies on when that comes online a few years later. Earth and super-Earth-sized planets in their habitable zones being a key hope for TESS. And like TESS, Plato will look for these Earth and super-Earth-sized planets around nearby stars, but aims to look at the seismic activity of all those suns to map the age, radius and mass of the stars that have interesting planets around them. And then by combining Plato's data with ground-based observations, we should be able to get a reliable indication of the mass, radius, density and composition of those interesting exoplanets themselves. And that's all with the hope of finding that Earth analogue that could support life. This is those incremental jumps in our understanding of exoplanets, objects that we didn't even have the slightest evidence for just 24 years ago. And all of these missions add weight to the statement from ESO's Joe Liska, who we interviewed last month, when he said that he's reasonably convinced that we'll discover life elsewhere in the galaxy within our lifetime. And uh, So when does this fly? Well, Plato will launch on a Russian Soyuz rocket from French Guyana in 2017, and it'll join ESA's Gaia and the WMAP probe in the second Lagrangian point a million miles from Earth. Yeah, really looking forward to results from that one, and luckily we're not looking at it being a decade or so away like so many newly accepted missions can often take to get built and launched. But now, let's go back to the second part of my audio report from Iceland. Is there any astronomy in this part? Well, if you class Aurora's astronomy, then yes. Mm. Very rude. Okay, so I'm stood in the dark now. It's getting on for midnight out here, 64 degrees in latitude. And the skies are absolutely beautiful. The moon's out, but it's casting quite a bit of glow. So it needs to be quite a good aurora, but I can see some flickering on the northern horizon. So the things you need to look out for when you're hunting aurora is, well, you need dark skies away from any light pollution and ideally a moonless night unlike tonight, though the moon can help brighten up your images and landscapes if you're photographing aurora. You obviously need 
clear cloud free skies that's the most important thing if you've got cloud you're you're not going to see anything unless it's the brightest aurora and it can shine through some of the the faintest thinnest clouds and you also need solar activity to be on your side too because solar flares and their larger cousins the coronal mass ejections fling particles mostly photons or particles of light but also charged particles like protons through the solar system. And if the sun's magnetic field is carried as far as the Earth by one of these flares or coronal mass ejections, and its polarity is south, opposing the Earth's northward magnetic polarity, when these two magnetic fields interact, those charged particles can inject energy into our planet's magnetosphere, triggering auroras. And what we see is those particles getting pulled around the Earth's poles in a ring, stripping electrons from oxygen and nitrogen atoms. And when these atoms return to their normal neutral state, 50 to 100 miles up in the atmosphere, they spit out a photon, a particle of light, which combined with billions of other atoms spitting out particles of light. They sail and dance overhead in this magnificent ethereal light show. And I'm seeing some shimmering in the sky right now. And it really is a beautiful ribbon of light, quite faint on the horizon. It's nothing like you get on the photographic images, but when you see them in the images, wow, it really does come out great. But you'll also notice that they're dancing in the sky you know the, sometimes they're barely discernible from thin clouds but then they'll get brighter and brighter and you see them as these curtains of light and ribbons as i'm seeing now that are dancing in the sky and it really is quite magical and you can understand why so many myths grew up around them now what i was saying about before with the photons and the electrons that's the technical description but all the layman needs to know is that we're in solar maximum now so the sun's at its most energetic and if you travel to northern russia alaska finland greenland or iceland travel away from any light pollution and find clear skies you stand a great chance of seeing this light show now they can light up over the course of a few minutes without any warning and, and this can happen many times a night They'll dance overhead for a few minutes or up to an hour and then fade out just as quickly as they came. So patience is the key. But right now I'm seeing this light in the sky that is unlike anything I've ever seen before. And it really is beautiful. The way it just dances around and it curls around and creates knots in the sky with almost seeming like it's dripping from the sky in a long ribbon with a curtain hanging over it. And uh, I think I'm starting to see some green light in it now. And I'm going to enjoy this show, take some images of it, and I'm going to wait for more to appear, spend a couple more hours out here imaging them, so I'll put those images up on Facebook and Twitter. And for now, I'll hand you back over to Paul. So to explain the baffling or introduce you to new concepts in astronomy, it's time for Paul's 5-minute concept. In this month, we're delving further into the weird and wonderful realm of this expanding universe, as Paul tells us about redshift. If you look under the first balcony of the Eiffel Tower, you will find engraved 72 names of famous French scientists, engineers and mathematicians. Lagranger, Ampère, Bacquerel, Corellis, all look out across the Parisian skyline, but you'll need a good pair of eyes to search 57 metres above the ground for the gold letters spelling them out. There is one particular name nestled between a chemist and an industrialist that sits on the southwest side looking out each day towards the red horizon of the setting sun. That of the physicist Fizeau. Hippolyte Fizeau. Known for improvements to the photographic method, working capacitors, and in 1849 for calculating the most precise measurement of the speed of light they had been to that point. But his most important work is perhaps the observation of the behaviour of light, while working on the newly discovered Doppler effect. It is something we are all familiar with, though perhaps never pay much attention to. The sound of the passing car, the screech of the passing train whistle, that ambulance that rushed by. The change in pitch as the sound passes you is a familiar one, the rising pitch as the sound approaches followed by the sudden reverse and deepening of the sound as it moves away from you. A familiar occurrence in the modern world, but one not explained until 1842, when the condensing and stretching nature of waves from a moving source was proposed by Austrian Christian Doppler. What you hear is the increasing pitch of the approaching siren, is the sound waves essentially being bunched up as the emitting vehicle comes closer and closer, 
each subsequent wave being emitted slightly closer to the previous wave than before. Wavelength decreases, frequency increases. Like the bow wave on the front of a ship, the bunched up waves bombard your ear until the vehicle passes. Then the opposite occurs, as the emitter moves ever further away, the sound waves become longer and the frequency lower, just as the waves elongate on the water behind the ship. That is the everyday experience of the Doppler effect. But what Fizeau realised is that it didn't end with sound, that light too displayed a Doppler effect, and by doing so explained a puzzle. Stellar spectroscopy really could be said to have started with Newton, when he, as the poet Keats put it, unweaved the rainbow. But it became apparent in the 19th century that it was a rainbow with some of the weave missing, when dark lines began to be observed, missing chinks of light in the sun's spectra. This phenomenon, known as Fraunhofer lines, named after a German physicist, were first observed in 1802 by the English chemist Wallerstein. Fifty years after their discovery, the nature of these lines was basically understood as corresponding to different chemical elements present in the sun's atmosphere, though it would need early 20th century physics and chemistry, in particular the discovery of atomic structure, to fully explain why these lines actually appeared. But back in the 19th century, what was observed increasingly was that the spectra of some stars seemed to be the same as the Sun, yet a little different. Same lines, same pattern, slightly different position. As if the whole spectra had been shifted somehow. For Zoe realised it was a Doppler effect. That like the compression or stretching of passing sound waves, the movement of stars was condensing or stretching the emitted light. A star moving towards the observer would display a light of slightly shortened wavelength, shifting the spectra towards the blue while a star moving away would, like the sound of a train that has already passed by, demonstrate a longer wavelength of light, moving the spectra towards the red. Red shift. It was this idea that would herald the dawn of that most 20th century of fields, cosmology. Vesto Slipher in 1912 demonstrated that what was still called spiral nebulae at the time had considerable red shifts, conferring on them considerable speed away from us and the hint of vast distance. It was, of course, the pipe-smoking English-affected Edwin Hubble who demonstrated that the spiral nebulae were actually galaxies and that the distances were far more than hints, but very real and unimaginably vast. Using redshift, astronomers were able to show that the newly discovered universe was on the move and as it would transpire, expanding away from every point, growing ever larger. Redshift has become key to our unweaving of the universe. If I held a tennis ball on the second level of the Eiffel Tower, another 50 metres above Fizeau and his 71 companions. That would be the area of sky, as seen from the ground that astronomers, via Edwin Hubble's namesake, the Hubble Space Telescope, have been searching in for galaxies, distant, faint galaxies. An exposure of two million seconds has revealed galaxies close to the beginning of time itself, the youngest from 13.2 billion years ago. We know this due to red shift, Z, as it is written into the maths of astronomy and cosmology. The higher the number, the greater the red shift and the greater the expanded distance of the universe between us and the observed galaxy. Before the famous Hubble Deep Field, few galaxies with Z greater than 1 had been seen. Deep Field moved the marker to 6, while the Hubble Ultra Deep Field moved this to 12, with images of early proto-galaxies that gave out their first light just 700 million years after the Big Bang. If this was all that Fizeau had given the world, it would be pretty special and worthy of inscription. But there's one more experiment that Fizeau tried with the speed of light that began a chain reaction way beyond his own laboratory. In the 1850s, he built an interferometer to measure the drag caused on light by the theory of the day luminiferous ether. The result was not what was expected at the time, and so began the death of one type of physics, and one view of the universe, followed by the subsequent birth of a new science, quantum and a new expanding universe for it to inhabit, measured by red shift. Thanks for that, Paul, and you'll want to remember this for later when our interview guest refers to red shift as a measure of distance. For the interview this month, I'm delighted to be joined by Carol Mundell, Professor of Extragalactic Astronomy at Liverpool John Moores University's Astrophysics Research Institute. Hi, Carol. Hi, Ralph. Thanks for joining us on Awesome Astronomy this month. It's great to speak to you today, Ralph. 
Well, I'm excited to be speaking with you today because your areas of research concern the most violent and energetic events in the universe, way more energetic even than supernovae. And um, I guess this is a job that somebody looks for when seismology or nuclear arsenal design doesn't provide enough energy to satisfy them, is it? Absolutely. It certainly satisfies my violent tendencies. Yeah. Um, as you say, yes, these are, I mean, we're talking about active galactic nuclei and gamma ray bursts, all driven by by black holes. Um, in the case of active galactic nuclei, supermassive black holes, about a million to a billion times the mass of our own sun, lying at the centers of all large bulge dominated galaxies in the universe. And they probably play a really vital role in the formation and evolution of galaxies throughout cosmic history. Mm -hmm. At the other extreme are gamma ray bursts, which are produced in the death throes of massive stars. When large stars, two to three hundred times the mass of our own sun, reach the end of their lives, they live fast, they die hard, they, um, their cores collapse to form a stellar mass black hole, so about the mass of our sun, and in doing so, they blast their outer layers off um, at such speeds that actually the light is beamed into a, a very narrow angle um, due to relativistic effects, and when that beam of light points towards the Earth, we see the brightest, most luminous, insta instantaneously luminous um, flash of gamma rays in the sky at that time. And uh, you mentioned a moment ago about the active galactic nuclei and supermassive black holes. They're two areas of your research. Um, and there seems to be a, a symbiotic relationship between the two. And I'll ask you a bit more about that relationship in a minute. But can you go into a bit more detail about what the active galactic nuclei and supermassive black holes are, what the differences are and, and how they come together? Yes, um, I mean, active galactic nuclei um, were discovered in the form of quasars in the late 1960s, um, but just found as bright blue point-like sources. Um, and when scientists measured the light in the form of a spectrum, and they couldn't identify lines that looked very star-like. And in fact, the light wasn't produced by starlight. It was actually produced um, by light being produced in the, the accretion disk where material um, reaches towards the black hole. It has angular or orbital uh, momentum. And as it rubs together with friction, it starts to heat up. Mm -hmm. And the light that was being produced in these objects um, in the optical didn't really look very starlight. So they're a bit of a mystery. And at the same time, radio astronomers were able to, to see the, the structure, um, particularly in these um, so-called radio loud AGN. So these are AGN that produce, we now know, um, vast plumes of, of plasma. And these these jets or plumes of plasma stretch to, to megaparsecs, so millions and millions of light years. And we now realize that these these jets of material are actually the exhaust material. So what we're, we're try to what we try to do is by studying the light that comes from the exhaust, we try to understand what's going on in the engine under in, in the bonnet, if you like. Um, and so it was realised that normal stellar or nuclear fusion processes could not be efficient enough to power these beasts. And so it was realised that actually it's the potential energy from material falling down towards the black hole that is released um, that allows the AGN to shine so brightly. And so assume this is very similar to the way that free-floating black holes show us where they are and, and how they emit light as well, but on a much bigger scale, is it? Well, that's right. And you, you touch on an interesting point there. I mean, people tend to think of black holes as cosmic vacuum cleaners. We describe them as regions in space inside which the pull of gravity is so great, nothing can escape, not even light. So, of course, a question that I often get asked is, well, if they're black and they don't emit light, how can we see them? And the two main ways to know that we have black holes at the centers of galaxies are indirectly by looking at the exhaust material. So this is stuff that obviously hasn't made it over the event horizon, but because it has angular momentum, probably something to do with the magnetic field, being able to focus and funnel this material and accelerate it back out of the galaxy, that's a symptom of having a black hole. And of course, the direct way of proving that you have a black hole at the center of your galaxy is actually by measuring um, how quickly the stars and the gas orbit around the central black hole, very much in the way that scientists in previous centuries watched the motion of the planets around our own sun, so the gravitational attraction of the sun, the centripetal acceleration of the planets around the solar system. You can can do the same thing with stars and gas close to a, a black hole and in fact we know we have a black hole at the center of our own milky way that's a few million uh, times the mass of, of our own sun by actually looking at how the stars orbit around that black hole 
So we're inferring properties about the object that we can't actually see by what's in orbit around it. That's right. And we actually know that the, the density of material in the centre of our own Milky Way that would be required to cause the accelerations that we see in the stars orbiting there um, is so high that it, it can't be anything else other than a black hole. If it was something like a very dense star cluster, it would have evap evaporated long ago. So it, it should be a black hole in that small region. And you've been doing plenty of research studying the causal links between these supermassive black holes and the formation and evolution of galaxies. Can you tell us what the situation is now believed to be with regard to the, the influence that supermassive black holes have on forming galaxies and determining the future of galaxies? Yes, so initially when AGN or active galactic nuclei were discovered, it was thought that they were just a very rare and special case. And in fact, people who studied galaxies threw all of the AGN out of their samples. People who studied, for example, the high energy X-rays that came from AGN didn't really care about the host galaxy. And in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, those two communities have come together. And this is something that I've, I've worked on very much at the interface of these two communities, trying to understand both the role of the AGN in terms of changing its host galaxy environment and also what the role of the host galaxy might be in triggering and fueling the supermassive black holes. Because we know in the local universe that we no longer have the most powerful quasars. These were most active around about a redshift of two. In the local universe, we have less active versions called CFIC galaxies. So these are supermassive black holes that are about 100 million times the mass of our sun. They live in spiral galaxies and they're weaker versions of the quasars. So what my team have been trying to understand is the causal connection between the gas and the stars in the host galaxy and the activity at, in the central engine. So which affects which most, if you like. And we also had a stream of gas uh, moving past the, the supermassive black hole in the centre of our galaxy um, just last year, I think it was. Were we able to learn anything about the centre of our galaxy from that? So so this is a very interesting gas cloud. Well, the, the debate is whether it's a star or a cloud mm. of gas. We know that um, there is a stream of gas that's being stretched around close to our central black hole in the, the central star cluster, these group of stars that we've used to show that we have a black hole at the centre of our Milky Way. Um, and scientists started to see this gas being stretched out and they were measuring its velocity and its path and we were looking last year really we were expecting to see possibly a, a bright flash of x-rays as this gas was destroyed um, we didn't actually see that happening and um, there was some hint that it might have happened but in fact it turned out to be um, a highly magnetized star along the line of sight towards the central black hole so that was very exciting to discover that but we're still waiting for the fireworks and in fact the gas is still there and we think that over the coming months we might start to see the fireworks from that gas being disrupted by the gravitational forces close to the black hole so that that's a very exciting thing to to keep an eye out for um and you mentioned earlier about gamma ray bursts these are really energetic single events and they sit at the far end of the electromagnetic spectrum way beyond visible light how were they first detected uh, given that we haven't had gamma ray detectors for for a long time and how do we study them now so gamma ray bursts were discovered um, in the late 60s, around about the same time as the discovery of quasars and pulsars. And they were actually detected by U.S. military satellites, which were orbiting the Earth and monitoring, and particularly Russia, um, in case the Russians decided to violate the nuclear test ban treaty. So the, these satellites were looking down at the Earth and looking for flashes that would be produced by nuclear explosions on the Earth. Um, and the scientists that were working in these teams found flashes in the detectors. And for a short while, there may have been some tension <laughs> as to what was producing those flashes. But very quickly, they realized that, in fact, they weren't coming from the Earth. They were extraterrestrial and they were coming from the sky. And so they, they found that they published the very first spectrum in the early 70s. Now, the field didn't develop much more after that because the localization or the accuracy of the direction in which these gamma rays came from on the sky was very, very poor. And so optical and radio astronomers were not able to point their telescopes and know where these flashes came from. I mean, these flashes, the, the first spectrum lasted for less than 10 seconds. So, of course, no other astronomer could look that quickly in that direction and find any other electromagnetic signature at any other part of the electromagnetic spectrum like the radio and the visible. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the real breakthrough came um, all the way in the late 1990s, actually 1997, when the Dutch-Italian satellite Beppo-Sax was able to get an X-ray counterpart with 
with very good localization down to arc seconds, about 10 hours after the gamma ray flash had been and gone, mm -hmm. and the X-rays last a bit longer. And that was when the first optical photograph and therefore the first optical spectrum was measured. And up until that point, um, we knew that these things were distributed equally across the sky. They were isotropically distributed. No one preferred direction was producing these gamma rays. And so the big debate was really whether they were very bright because they were objects nearby in the halo of our own Milky Way, or whether they were intrinsically incredibly powerful and at the edge of the distant universe. And scientists, up until 1997, people were starting to think, yeah, they're probably galactic objects. There'll be something exotic in the halo of our own Milky Way. First spectrum was measured in 1997. It proved that they were cosmological and so they're the most powerful explosions we know of in the universe and i think we had a gamma ray burst in leo i think it was if i remember rightly last year um that was one of the brightest ones seen did we learn anything from that well, that, that was a very exciting object. Um, I mean, the SWIFT satellite, which is a NASA satellite, which catches the gamma rays from gamma ray bursts, and it sends its no notification of the position and the time of the burst to, to telescopes all across the, the globe. Uh, my team used robotic telescopes, such as the Liverpool telescope on the island of La Palma. And so we then follow up the optical light from these gamma ray flashes, and we can learn all sorts of things about the bursts. Traditionally, we're looking at so-called long gamma ray bursts. These are bursts that last longer than two seconds, typically tens to hundreds of seconds, sometimes longer. And most of these objects are found at high redshift, as I've said, you know, round about redshift one and beyond. And we found them right up to redshift of eight and nine. Mm -hmm. There are a very small number of bursts that we found more locally, so round about a redshift of a half. And for those, we can look for the signature of a supernova later on in time. And that's what connects long gamma ray bursts with the death of massive stars. But the small number of objects that we found below a redshift of one have all been sub-energetic events. And so we were starting to think, well, maybe there's there are two different kinds of populations. The long gamma ray bursts that are very powerful that are in the DO universe and the sub-energetic events that are in the more local universe. So the burst that happened in, in April last year was it was the highest gamma ray fluence ever detected and it lay at just a redshift of 0 0.3. Now you may be thinking well obviously it seems bright because it's nearby but it was intrinsically a very powerful event and when we caught the optical light with our robotic telescopes we showed that actually it looks like a classical long gamma ray burst. So we had this monster event which looks exactly the same as the very beefy events that happen at redshift 4 happening right for our terms on our doorstep. And are we inferring that this is colliding black holes or neutron stars? Well, the long gamma ray bursts we think are produced by the core collapse of a, of a massive star. Um, the short gamma ray bursts, which are which come and go in less than two seconds. Uh, some of them, the flashes can be as short as 64 milliseconds. Um, we think that they're the ones that are probably produced by the merger of two compact objects like neutron star and a black hole or, or black holes. And they were the ones that were traditionally seen in the more local universe as, the, as some sub-energetic events. So it came as a real surprise to see this classical long gamma ray burst um, produced at a redshift of only 0.3. Now, away from your own research, you're also very keen to promote women in academia and science, and you were involved in the BBC's expert women events to encourage and equip more women to become presenters and contributors in science and other, in quotes, non-traditional female subject matters. So how did that go and how do you think we're seeing the benefits yet? Yeah, this is something I think is, is very important. I mean, you know, half of our population are, are women mm -hmm. um, and women and men have, have equal talent mm -hmm. um, when it comes to any one subject. But of course, physics has been traditionally a very male dominated subject. Um, and certainly when I came through school and university, I was a very small minority of women in my classes. Um, Girls are keen on science, they're excited about physics and maths. We seem to have um, a, a bit of an image problem, in, in particularly in Britain, that these are seen as hard subjects or traditionally male subjects. And the BBC, as many of the British universities now are recognising, could see that there was a huge pool of expert women. So this is a talent that was actually not being exploited and not being used fully. And in fact, it's a bit of a no brainer when you have this talent pool um, in half of your population that you 
should dip into it and actually um, use it. And so it, it was a fascinating event. Um, we learned all sorts of um, new things like live TV, radio broadcast, um, pieces to camera. And that was really just to give us a flavor of working with the media in a professional setting. And I know many of the women who came to that day and others that were held around the country have gone on to work uh, much more closely in the media, um, both camera, radio and, and the print, print media. And so I think it's, it's valuable for both you know, women who are in the professional setting and also young women who are thinking of coming up and working in traditionally male-dominated fields, be it journalism, be it science, um, that there are women who are out there doing it and who have a passion for it and who can communicate about it. Yeah, and we're certainly seeing people such as uh, Maggie Adderin Pocock and Helen Chertsey and Lucy Green on the Sky at Night and seeing a lot more female contributors on the news when we're talking about astronomy and science-related fields. That's right. And I think the sky at night, you know, in years gone by was fairly male dominated. It's yeah, great very to much see so. these new, you know, women commentators out there. And this was something that the BBC were very keen to do, particularly in the news agenda. And they actually did a study and they um, looked across their, their outlets to see what the male female ratio for expert commentators were. So not presenters per se, but actually experts invited onto various programs to commentate on, on news items of the day. And they've, they've done a great job of actually turning that round. I've done a number of news items, um, particularly for BBC Breakfast and Radio 5 Live, topical, on the spot, that moment, you know, astronomy stories, be it the meteor showers, be it a comet. Um, and I think that, you know, this can only really do the BBC good. Um, and it's, you know, it's good for, for, for women generally uh, who are listening in, in their homes. Yeah, and uh, all credit to the BBC for trying to make good on their earlier neglect, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you were also nominated as Liverpool John Moores University's mentor for the Leadership Foundation's Aurora programme, and this is an ongoing programme to encourage women to think of themselves as future leaders in academia and to develop the skills they need to achieve this. Uh, how's that programme going? Well, that's that's a remarkable programme. I went to the, the first kickoff meeting last week in Manchester um, and there were 230 women in one room, <laughs> uh, which was certainly as a physicist is nothing I've ever experienced before. <laughs> um, they come from higher education across the UK, travelling, you know, as far as from Bournemouth, Southampton and Ireland. Um, and it was it was a very high paced day. We had uh, many exercises to do. I hosted a table of young women um, and shared my experiences of being a leader in science and I certainly learned a lot from them and their experiences as well that first one was about uh, voice and leadership and there are three more um, facilitated workshops coming up over the coming months and then there'll also be a learning set where um, both the mentors and also the nominated attendees from each university will go back to their host institutions and begin to work on uh, more one-to-one -one skills um, and mentoring and developing specific things that the, the participants want to, to work on so I think it's a phenomenal program and I think it's really powerful. They're hoping to get something like 580 women through it this year and they're hoping to ramp wow. up to 1,000 women per year over the coming five years, which will actually revolutionise our university horizons. Yeah, that does sound very practical as well. Uh, how else would you like to see universities specifically reach out to young men and women that haven't necessarily considered a career in academia or space science or astronomy-related fields? I think astronomy is actually quite special because it fires the human imagination mm -hmm. and certainly my experience has been that wherever I am whoever I'm speaking to be it somebody at a bus stop or on a train um, even my own wedding I was explaining what black holes were until somebody <laughs> pointed out I should go ahead and eat something and dance um, people are just fascinated and I've never met anyone who says who cares about the universe and why should we bother people have questions all the time so my impression is there's a vast appetite out there for knowledge and and I think that, you know, universities are trying very hard to engage with that, not just in terms of bringing in undergraduates, but also in, you know, public outreach events. There are many new events starting across the country where, there, for example, Stargazing Live has been very effective at um, bringing amateur astronomy societies more to the public gaze and people are starting up their own star parties and wanting to know just what to look at in the sky and mm -hmm. what it all means. So I think that's very promising. You know, young people at primary school age have fantastic 
fantastic questions. I mean, I gave a public lecture last year and a little boy in the audience, maybe six years old, asked me, how did the Milky Way form? Wow. Um, that was probably the hardest question that I had <laughs> in that, that presentation. There were probably 100 adults there. And I said, you know, that's a really good question. Keep on asking questions like that. <laughs> Well, thanks for speaking with us this month on Awesome Astronomy. It's been fascinating to learn about your research and your promotion of women in astronomy. Professor Carol Mundell, thank you. Thank you, Ralph. And now we come to the part of the show that you control. If you've got any questions about astronomy, cosmology, astrophysics or Dan Dare comics, this is the place to come. We'll answer your questions if we can and we'll blag it if we can't. So our first question this month is from Matt Kingsnorth via our Facebook group and Matt asks, Something's been bothering me. How many aliens were killed when Supernova 2014J went up? Just visually comparing the size of the Nova against the size of M82, there must have been an awful lot of roasted star systems. Paul, how many people did it kill? Well, it does look that way, doesn't it? Um, in fact, when I took my first look at the supernova just a couple of days after discovery, I saw the glow of the explosion, I think, before I saw the full wisp of M82, um, such as the sky in West London. Um, but before going any further, it is worth reminding ourselves of what Ralph said earlier about this discovery being a fantastic piece of serendipity on the part of Stephen Fossey of the University College London and his four undergraduates who were undertaking a training session on a telescope at the Mill Hill Observatory in North London. Um, they took advantage of a small break in the clouds and demonstrated that even an observatory in a light-polluted city can make great discoveries. Mm. Anyway, back to the event itself. Um, at its peak on February the 2nd, it reached magnitude about 10. Um, now, that isn't naked eye, but when you consider that it's, in a, it's a star in another galaxy around 12 million light-years away, it gives you a sense of just how bright these things are. Now... Nominally, M82 has an apparent magnitude of 8.4, but of course it's a diffuse source, so while it's one of the brighter galaxies an amateur can gaze on, it's not a standout bright object. So first of all, you have point source versus diffuse source in terms of how bright this looked. Now, to deal with the explosion itself, just how big a blast was it? Well, apparent magnitude is a bit of a guide, but absolute magnitude is better. Now, this is a measure used in astronomy to essentially calibrate the brightness of stars in the sky, and it's a measure of how bright an object would be seen from 10 parsecs, or 32.6 light years. Now, this is done because apparent magnitude is based not just on how bright a star is, but how distant it is. Um, so a very close dim star can appear brighter than a very distant bright star. So absolute magnitude cancels out the distance issue. So in the case of the Sun, which on Earth appears to be magnitude minus 26.74, um, the Sun at 32.6 light years appears a dim 4.83. So, demonstrating that the Sun in stellar hierarchy is not all that. So, what was SN 2014J's absolute magnitude? Well, if it had been 32.6 light years away and not 12 million, what would we have seen? Well, there's often speculation in the media um, with that phrase, a second sun in the sky, <laughs> um, a bit about comets or Betelgeuse exploding. But in the case of a Type 1A supernova, this would not be much of an exaggeration. <laughs> um, SN 2014J and all its Type 1A buddies, um, they hit an astonishing minus 19.3. And remember, that, that's from 10 parsecs away. Um, that makes it 5 billion times brighter than the sun. Oh. Uh, 5 billion, yeah. Um, so a Type 1A releases about 2 times 10 to the 44 joules of energy. That's a 2 with 44 zeros after it. <laughs> this is a supernova type that is caused by a white dwarf orbiting a larger star and stripping material from the star like some sort of stellar parasite. Eventually, a runaway fusion event occurs um, in and on the White Dwarf, and that's what we see, essentially an exposed stellar core fusing away with abandon. It releases so much energy that the particles of the star are unbound, and it flies apart at speeds approaching one-sixth the speed of light. So that's up to sort of 20,000 kilometres a second. So if there were a hapless civilization clinging to a rocky planet at a similar distance that Earth is from the Sun... Um, the planet would have been shredded a little over three quarters of an hour afterwards, um, though a light five billion times brighter than the sun would have done a wee bit of damage just eight minutes after ignition, <laughs> so, along with gamma rays, x-rays and a very intense neutrino burst. So in a few hours, a solar system like ours would have been erased completely. So no question, really. So what about other solar systems? 
Well, if we take the average for distance between stars from our own Milky Way, four or five light years between them, um, then it would have been four or five years before any neighbouring system was even aware of the event, as the sky suddenly brightened intensely along with the associated radiations. Following on behind at the earliest 24 to 30 years later would be the material of the disintegrated star. More spread out, travelling a little bit more slowly, but nonetheless it would be unlikely to be good news for a, a close neighbouring system. So... Now as we travel out, the swelling ball material it covers more star systems, but also slows down, loses energy, and spreads itself more thinly. Ten light years from our sun, there are about 12 stars. Uh, interesting fact in itself. Taking this as an example, that means 12 star and potentially planetary systems would have seen the explosion after 10 years, and felt the effects of the explosion something like sort of probably 100 years afterwards. Now, we have a good example of what happens... Um, after a Type 1a supernova with um, a remnant in the Large Magellanic Cloud called SNR 0519. Now, this is a remnant of an explosion 600 years ago, um, and it's still expanding at speed, no, not at anything like the initial rate, and currently it is 25 light years across. It's a stunning object, by the way. Do take a look at the recent images from Hubble. Now, this still doesn't answer the whole question, really. How many planetary systems bought it in that explosion and how many aliens died? Well, short answer is one system. The explosion happened mid-January, so the shockwave is a few weeks out, having destroyed any planets that may have been in the area. Long answer is that any nearby systems are in trouble um, in the early years and that planets for many light years away will be struck by the ever-expanding bubble of high-speed star leftovers for centuries. What effect that will have will depend on the density and speed of the material to a given point, but the remnant of SNR 0519 is now very tenuous, really. As for aliens, well, if you want to imagine the universe like Star Trek, then many billions died and billions are about to, given the density of civilizations in that universe. If Star Wars is more your thing, then Obi-Wan is probably having a fatal fit over the disturbance in the Force, and given that this happened in M82 and not our own Milky Way, then it's certainly a case of a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So I hope that answers your question, Matt. And our next question comes from Thomas Hawkins, who's six years old, and Thomas asks... Why? I know the sun's made of hydrogen helium, but and the balloon floats up because there's helium inside it. Why doesn't the sun float away? Well, I really like this question, Thomas, because when I was around your age, it didn't make sense to me either. I couldn't understand why even planets had atmospheres, because surely gases just rise up and they should be lost into space. But this is where those atomic numbers that you'll learn in chemistry in a few years matter so much, because all elements in the universe, whether we're talking about hydrogen, carbon or platinum, they're all made of protons, neutrons and electrons, which all have mass or weight. Very tiny amounts of mass, but they still add up. Now, when the Earth was formed, it was hot and molten, a thick liquid lava, and that meant that the heaviest materials sank towards the centre, so the Earth has an iron core. Then it has the lighter rocky mantle and crust around it, and then the lightest elements, the gases, are further from the centre than the rocky parts and stick to the planet as its atmosphere, and they're all held in place by the planet's gravity, with the heaviest materials nearer the centre, and the lighter elements further away. So try and think of it like this. If you filled a fish tank with nitrogen, any oxygen you put into that tank would be heavier than the nitrogen, even though they're both gases, and the oxygen would sink to the bottom. Any helium you put in the tank would rise to the top because it's lighter than both oxygen and nitrogen. Now if you filled the tank with the lightest gas, hydrogen, and put either nitrogen or helium in there, they'd both sink to the bottom because they're both heavier than hydrogen. And it's a difficult concept to grasp that every gas has some weight, but they do. Gas has mass. Now, smaller bodies like the Moon and Mercury are so small that they don't have enough gravity to hold onto their atmospheres, and their gases do disappear off into space. Whereas the larger planets like Saturn and Jupiter, they've got loads of gravity and hold their gases tightly, which is why they've got very thick atmospheres. Now, the Sun is so massive that it makes up 99.86% of everything in the solar system. So while it's mostly made of hydrogen and helium, holding it close, despite how little it weighs, isn't a problem for the Sun. In fact, it's the huge gravitational attraction that makes the Sun the Sun. It pulls on hydrogen atoms so tightly that they try to occupy the same space and fuse together to create helium atoms. And when they do this, they spit out some energy. So if you think about the sun as a raging fireball, which is what it is, 
you get some idea of how much helium it has to make each second to produce all that energy that it's releasing all the time. Now, as that helium's heavier than the hydrogen that was there before, the sun's gravity can easily hold on to that, and eventually, when it runs out of hydrogen, it'll try to stay alive, in inverted commas, by trying to fuse the helium into carbon, which is where the elements in the universe heavier than lithium ultimately come from. So whether we're talking about the really hot gases that make up a star, or the gases that make up the atmospheres of planets, it's gravity pulling them down in all directions that holds them in place and stops them floating away. And if we come back to the Earth, hydrogen and helium in the upper atmosphere do actually drift off into space because it's so light. The total mass of all the nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide and small amounts of other gases in the Earth's atmosphere weigh 5.8 million billion tons. That's a millionth the mass of Earth itself. But given that the Earth weighs 6 billion trillion tons, all that gravitational attraction is always trying to hold on to all that gas. Interestingly, the Earth gets 40,000 tons heavier each year from all the meteorites that fall to the ground, but it loses 50,000 tons each year from the helium and hydrogen that are lost to space. So every year, despite the space rocks that fall to Earth, the planet actually gets 10,000 tons lighter because of the amount of helium and hydrogen that goes the other way out into space. Well, that's just about all for this month, but we'd like to thank everyone who nominated us for a Shorty Podcasting Award this yeah. year. Just being nominated was humbling and encouraging, and while we don't fancy our chances, thank you very, very much. Yes, thank you. We'd also like to thank Ian Morris, who got Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield's book signed and sent to us. And also those of you who sent nice and encouraging emails about the show to us this month. Yes, thank you. But let's not let the love wither on the vine here. If you enjoy the show, please do give us a review on iTunes. We do the podcast and all our astronomy outreach endeavours for free, and we really appreciate you helping us out to bring astronomy to ever wider audiences and maybe, hopefully, new people that hadn't had an interest in astronomy before. The reason we were so excited to be among the Shorty Award nominees. And don't forget that we have the March Sky Guide already available to download on iTunes, or you can watch the animated version on YouTube. And you can get more astronomy awesomeness any day of the year on Google+, Twitter at Awesome Astropod, and Facebook by searching for the Awesome Astronomy Group. Don't forget that we'll be beaming down to London in the first week of March to support National Astronomy Week, and we'll be setting up a few scopes to show the non-astronomy involved public perhaps their first ever views of Jupiter and your moon. We hope to be at Hyde Park Speaker's Corner one evening and the South Bank on another. But as this is all weather dependent, we'll decide which night's around the 1st of March, so keep an eye out on our social media channels, and if you're in London then, we'd love to see you. But until the April Sky Guide comes out in the last week of March, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced by Ralph Wilkins, Paul Hill, Damian Phillips and John Wildridge and is free to distribute for educational purposes. Music is courtesy of Star Salzman. For more astronomy news, views help and advice, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com. You can join in the astronomy discussion on our Facebook group and you can follow us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. We invite your questions to read out on the show. You can send them to us via Facebook, Twitter or by email at the show at awesomeastronomy.com. We thank you very much for listening from Cydonia Base End of transmission. Oh, look, there's Aurora. Ooh. It's not much. I'd better enhance it with curves on Photoshop.